I'm very pleased to welcome today um, Dr. David Jenkins. Uh, David is a lecturer in the Department of Physics at the University of York, uh, where his principal research interest is the area of experimental nuclear physics. Um, David's also the local organiser for um, events for the Institute of Physics, uh, and he runs a public lecture program and organises various outreach events. So he's a very experienced speaker, and I'm really looking forward to hearing him tell us about Rutherford and the birth of nuclear physics. Thanks, David. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, as she said, uh, I work at the University of York in the area of experimental nuclear physics. So I'm not really a historian of science, but what I'd like to try and do this afternoon is, is draw a little bit on my experiences as an active scientist in this area and look back sort of a hundred years to the beginnings of nuclear physics, which are, uh, are very much in, in most parts attributable to this great scientist, Ernest Rutherford. And we are coming to a very, very significant anniversary in a couple of years' time, which was when Rutherford's insight, based on some experiments that were done a year or two before, showed that there was a very, very tiny nucleus at the centre of the atom. And that radically changed our whole perception of what the physical world was made of. And that was in 1911. So in 2011, that will be a very sig significant centenary in terms of the work of Rutherford. And hopefully you will hear more about that because it will be an opportunity for people like me who are interested in public engagement in this area of science to get, get at the public a lot more about the topic of, of nuclear physics. So let me give you a slight overview of what I want to talk about. I, I'm mainly going to focus on the work of Rutherford. I'm going to look at the early experiments that they did, the amazing work that they did, and, and how, how successful that was in understanding the subatomic world. I'm then going to bring that more up to date and look at Rutherford's legacy uh, in terms of science and in terms of the people that he trained. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about nuclear physics as it's done today. Is it still a, a topic that's as important as it was 100 years ago? What does someone like myself, who's a nuclear physicist, actually do? Where do we work? How would Rutherford see it if he were you know, looking at us 100 years uh, after he was very, very active? The first interesting thing to say in passing about that is you might be surprised that actually, despite the fact that nuclear physics was um, to a large extent born in, the, in, in this country, although Rutherford, of course, wasn't himself British by birth, he was a New Zealander, um, despite that, we don't actually have a nuclear physics facility in the UK anymore. And actually, nuclear physics is quite a small area compared to research in other major European countries like France and Germany and Italy. And so actually scientists like myself actually travel all around the world to do these experiments because there's no facilities in the UK. So that's quite interesting in terms of what we're going to talk about here. First thing to say about Rutherford is um, he's probably the most famous New Zealander, I think, uh, of all time. There are, there are other famous New Zealanders, but uh, uh, my prejudice is he's the most famous New Zealander of all time. And he's been, of course, widely celebrated in New Zealand, both on their banknotes and on their, their postage stamps. And he's really a, a household name there as somebody who came from what was uh, then uh, the turn of the 19th century, um, a rather distant part of the, uh, of the British Empire as it w then was, with not many people living there, uh, not much going on in terms of uh, industry and science and education. It was all very, very small scale. Um, but Rutherford was a really brilliant young man, even when he was at school. He was uh, the best in all of his classes. He was a brilliant rugby player, and he was clearly a larger-than-life personality. And so it wasn't really very long before he came to leave um, New Zealand after he'd done his undergraduate studies there. And so let's look at some of his early work. So the question here is what connects these two things here, um, which is the Great Exhibition of 1851 and uh, Cambridge University. Well, of course, the connection is 
that the residue of the money from the Great Exhibition of 1851 provided a number of scholarships that allowed at, the at that time and still do to a certain extent brilliant scientists from around the world, young, young people, uh, to come and study in this country. And so it was one of these scholarships, not a particularly large amount of money at the time, didn't allow um, Rutherford to live particularly well when he was a student at Cambridge, but it allowed him to progress from New Zealand to Cambridge in 1895. When he worked in New Zealand, he was actually quite interested in the beginnings of radio, and he did a lot of work in terms of receiving signals and sending signals over short distances. But when he arrived at Cambridge, which was mainly under the influence of the physicist J.J. Thompson at that time, it was really the beginnings of the exciting work in terms of radioactivity. And it wasn't very long before Rutherford really aligned himself with this work and became very, very closely um, associated with it. Once he finished his um, uh, work on his, uh, on his postgraduate work at Cambridge, he was very, very highly rated by his mentor, J.J. Uh, Thompson. He said he was one of the most brilliant students that they had. And so when a professorship of physics came up at McGill University in Montreal in, in, in Canada, um, Rutherford was immediately suggested by J.J. Thompson as being the most suitable candidate for this job, despite the fact he was only 26 years of age. And at that time, um, along with New Zealand, I think to some extent um, uh, North American or particularly Canadian science was not seen as so prestigious as what was going on in Britain and France and Germany. But nevertheless, Rutherford um, was, was to some extent motivated by wanting um, an opportunity to work on his own. And also there was quite good remuneration offered by uh, McGill University at that time, about $2,500. And this was the main draw to him so he could go there and save enough money so that his fiancée uh, could marry him and join him and, li and live together because his fiancée was still living in New Zealand at this time. When he came to McGill University, he was there for about 10 years and his main uh, collaborator there was this man, Frederick Soddy, who was a chemist and perhaps uh, a few years younger than um, uh, Rutherford was at that time. And the two of them worked together furiously on the beginnings of studying radioactivity. And they would obtain samples of radioactive material, um, mainly from Europe. So you have things like minerals like pitch blend, which have uranium and thorium and different types of radioactive material in them. They would obtain samples of these materials and they would devise increasingly sophisticated experiments to try and understand uh, what these radioactive materials were about, how they behaved and so on. And in the 10 years that Rutherford was at McGill, uh, these two characters produced about 20 scientific papers between them. One thing that's very interesting, and you can go away and look at this um, if you like, is that at McGill University, they have a collection of all of the uh, scientific equipment that Rutherford used during his time there. Somebody had the foresight when, when Rutherford left after not particularly a long period of time to basically put all this stuff in the cupboard and forget about it for 30 years. Of course, 30 years later, he was then extremely famous and then all this equipment was of great historical significance. So it's very fortunate that all this early equipment is, is maintained. If you go on the internet, you can have a look at it and see uh, what sort of things they were using. Of course, the, the, the great people in terms of radioactivity were the Curies, Pierre and Marie Curie working in, in France and their very early experiments on uh, radium and different types of radioactive material. And Rutherford was, to a certain extent, in a lot of correspondence with these people. Of course, the modern scientists using email and web and all this stuff, these people sending letters, but perhaps their collaborations were just as effective. Um, one of the main... Uh, contributions which Rutherford made at this time is of course absolutely central to any discussion of radioactive materials and that is the concept of a half-life and they deduced that things had a half-life by getting a sample of thorium and 
they had what they called an emanation from the forium. So there was some kind of gas coming off the forium that was itself radioactive. And of course we now know, or we would call that gas, radon gas. It's a chemical element of its own. And of course it, it emanates naturally from rocks. And to a certain extent it's harmful in certain parts of the country if people uh, inhale it. But it's a relatively short-lived radioactive substance. And so they were able to measure the activity, um, perhaps by things to the extent by which things became charged up by the presence of this radioactive gas. And they were able to see that its activity dropped off exponentially over time. And so Rutherford essentially discovered this behaviour that the activity of a substance fell off with a characteristic uh, half-life. And that's by virtue of the fact that radioactive decays are purely random uh, chance events. And so the statistics apply to them and that they fall off in this exponential manner. So that was clearly a very, very important contribution. And the other thing which was uh, followed on from that and was realised readily by Rutherford at the time was if these radioactive materials were decaying and they were giving out heat and there was a substantial amount of this uh, material in the earth, then it would keep the earth uh, warm uh, for a long period of time. And so from this radioactivity, Rutherford was able to estimate that the earth um, must be about 800 million years old. And the previous estimates were five or six million years uh, based on different considerations. And so Rutherford's estimate is perhaps about six times too short, but it was a very important contribution uh, to realise that radioactivity was very much connected with the age of the Earth, which is a very important uh, thing. If you also have a look at the McGill University site, you'll be able to look at some, of, some uh, diagrams which I've got here and also photographs of some of the very early experimental apparatus that Rutherford and Soddy working together devised. Um, it was mainly sort of glassware and things like electroscopes and various things that measured electric charges, electric fields to deflect things, magnetic fields to bend things and so on. And what they were interested in was they knew that there were two types of radiation at that time coming out of radioactive material. One of which had a comparatively short range. It could be stopped by uh, a sheet of paper or something and that they called alpha particles and the second type of radiation had a much longer range uh, and that they called beta particles. But it was initially not known what these things were. And so they devised a whole set of experiments, um, firstly showing that these particles carried an electric charge, and then once knowing they had an electric charge, they could bend them with magnetic fields and so on, and measure how much electric charge they carried, and also what the amount of charge was relative to the mass of, of, of this particle. And so from this early work, Rutherford was able to speculate that this alpha particle was actually like a, a helium uh, ion or helium atom coming out of a material. In fact, he wasn't able to demonstrate it uh, convincingly at that time but he, he showed it convincingly a couple of years later when he moved to Manchester University in 1908 that he actually did um, what's called spectroscopy on this um, gas that was given off, this helium gas, these alpha particles. He could trap it, measure it, and show that it was actually helium. That was convincing demonstration, but he had other inferences that showed what the nature of these different radiations actually was. And so... On the basis of this work that Rutherford carried out, showing what these different types of radiations were, and his speculations that it was one material changing character and changing property, uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1908, and he was given it for his investigations into the disintegration of, of the elements and the chemistry of radioactive uh, substances. And... Uh, the irony of being awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was not lost on Rutherford, who was a somewhat outspoken character, who was fond of saying all science is either physics or stamp collecting. And his idea was 
if it wasn't physics, it was more like, um, you know, botanical things where you were codifying and sort of t doing taxonomical things. He, he, he was really an experimental physicist. And he even said in his, his address when he received this, he said he'd seen many transmutations and transformations in the laboratory, um, but the uh, most rapid one that he'd seen was his translation into a chemist from a physicist. <laughs> but of course, they, they let him off for that because they, the, of the, uh, the brilliant work that he'd done at that time. But he was actually given the Nobel Prize for chemistry and not for physics. And one might argue which, which were the mo more appropriate. In fact, really, in these early days, these people would have been called nuclear chemists, and certainly the, the Curies would have been nuclear chemists. And people like Glenn Seaborg, who were discovering new elements, were nuclear chemists. But you won't really find that term nuclear chemist used very much uh, nowadays, or maybe for the past uh, 20, 30 years or so. But he was actually given the prize for, for chemistry. So I think... The, the other thing I, I, I kind of like with, with, with these pictures is it, the Rutherford looks always the, the Edwardian gentleman with wing collars and a moustache, and he really looks uh, so much of that age, I think, that sort of turn of the century. So the next question I want to have a look at in some detail was, was the one that, were, that which Rutherford is very much associated with, and that is, is the atom divisible. Of course, from the time of the Greeks and, and before, people have been trying to work out what was the physical world uh, made of. You know, was it earth, air, fire and water? You know, in the 19th century, chemistry started to uh, become more, more serious and we were showing that you could break things down into um, atoms and that these atoms were made of, of elements. But it wasn't clear uh, really what the structure of the physical world was at the lowest um, possible level. And as I say, the, the, the work of, of Dalton in particular was to postulate the existence of, of atoms being the, the smallest and most indivisible uh, form of, of matter. And so that if we had an infinite sort of uh, magnifying microscope and I were to look at this table, I would come down to some level where I would see something like solid little balls touching each other, and these would be my atoms. That's the picture uh, which Dalton uh, came about. The elements are made of tiny particles called atoms. All of these atoms are identical. Um, different elements are different from one another, and these elements combine according to certain chemical laws and principles to produce molecules uh, and more complicated substances. And moreover, these atoms cannot be uh, created or split up into smaller parts in the same way that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Atoms are something that are there and fixed for uh, all time. And this was the prevailing view uh, at the time of Dalton in the, the early 19th century. But this, um, this uh, picture of, of, the, of the world was to change um, around the end of the 19th century through the work of J.J. Uh, Thompson at the Cavendish Laboratory in, in Cambridge. And this was work based on things called cathode rays, which had been discovered that if you heated up gases uh, and you applied strong electric fields inside um, uh, vacuum chambers, you could produce uh, streams of particles, which they called cathode rays. And it could be shown by deflecting these particles in, a, in an electric field, that they must carry an electric charge. And in our modern terminology, we would call these cathode rays electrons. And of course, this is the principle by which uh, television sets and, and so on work, by making cathode rays or electrons steer onto a screen and, and illuminate the pixels. But what this at least showed was that one could obtain these, these tiny particles called electrons from atoms. So at some level, the atom couldn't just be a, a, a simple object. It must contain bits within it. And so that was then um, Thompson's model of the atom, which has been, come to be called the plum pu pudding model um, because it looks like little electrons um, stuck around inside a large atom um, which carries a positive charge. 
So the atom itself has no net electric charge, and because these electrons have a negative charge, there must be a balancing amount of positive charge in the rest of the stuff that makes up this, this atom. So this was the view of what an atom consisted of at the end of the 19th century, um, just a sort of refinement of the Dalton model, if you like, but that you could chip li little tiny bits off uh, that were a tiny fraction of the total uh, mass of the atom and that these were um, electrons. So um, <coughs> Rutherford moved to Manchester from McGill University in uh, 1907 or 8, I think. And when he came there, uh, he was invited by the professor who was retiring at that time, very famous uh, Professor Arthur Schuster, and he was invited to take over at Manchester, uh, again for a, for a very high salary at the time, a very, very uh, renowned character already, even though Rutherford was still um, ab about 35 or something when he, when he came to Manchester. And when he came there, he, he had access to much bigger facilities, much larger laboratories, workshops, and, and people than he had at McGill. He had many students and many assistants and instructors and so on. And one of the uh, particularly important instructors who worked with him uh, was this man, uh, Hans Geiger, who was a German, and of course he's noted for inventing the, 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 the Geiger counter for uh, detecting radiation. And he assisted Rutherford in preparing many of the experiments that they were involved in. And so what happened uh, at this time was that they, they had these alpha particles and they decided to start firing them at materials to see what would happen. And it led to the involvement of Ernest Marsden. This picture of him is obviously as an old man, but at this time he was an undergraduate. And Rutherford said, oh, we need a project for this Marsden to do. Uh, tell him to fire some alpha particles at some metals and see what happens really with the expectation that they perhaps wouldn't find uh, very much, because they had started making these measurements, uh, but then they decided to make them more ambitiously. And so let me explain. Um, this is a very, very famous experimental apparatus, uh, which we would now conventionally call either Rutherford scattering or the Geiger-Marsden experiment after the people who, who, who made this experiment, uh, Marsden the student and Geiger uh, who was the instructor. And what they had was a vacuum chamber. It's important it's a vacuum because these alpha particles won't travel very far in air. They will stop in air. So they'd have a source of alpha particles, a natural radioactive material, inside the vacuum chamber. They would put a, a very narrow slit in front of it so only a small stream of particles could come out in a rather well-defined sort of beam of particles. And then they would fire it at different... Uh, metal foils and these metal foils were very very thin they might only be say four or five hundred atoms thick these alpha particles would do something in the foil they'd go through they'd scatter or something and then they would hit a screen which had a material called zinc sulfide on it and this zinc sulfide would produce little scintillations of light little tiny flashes of light when these alpha particles hit it when they interacted with it and one could observe these, these little flashes by using a microscope and moving it around and having a look with the microscope. Absolutely time-consuming, probably eyesight-destroying work, I, I suspect. Um, apparently, Geiger was very good at this because he was very uh, uh, sort of stolid in doing his work. Marsden found this very, very difficult. Um, it, it certainly was very, very difficult compared to the sort of work that we would do now. But what they did was look where these alpha particles went. So they'd move the microscope around and they'd see perhaps what you might expect, that most of these alpha particles went straight through the foil because the foil's pretty thin. And so most of them went through and they, they hit the screen here. But they started to look at bigger and bigger angles. And what they found to their surprise was some of these alpha particles would come off over here or, or one in a few thousand or so would actually bounce straight back and come back over here somewhere. And um, once they'd, they'd found this, they rushed off and, and, and told Rutherford, and Rutherford came sort of uh, charging round in great excitement. 
And the famous phrase which Rutherford used at the time, uh, which of course was the time of the great battleships and everything, so this would have had a bit more resonance than it does now, um, but he said it was as if you'd fired a 15-inch shell, a big shell from a battleship, at a piece of tissue paper and found that the shell bounced back at you. This was a completely ludicrous thing uh, to have measured in terms of the prevailing science of the day. They did not expect this to happen. Either the alpha particles would come straight through or to some extent they would be absorbed and stopped in this, in this gold foil there. They shouldn't bounce back at very, very funny uh, angles. And this just really was not understood um, for a couple of years afterwards. It was um, uh, published by, um, I think it's, oh, it was published by Geiger and Marsden actually in 1909, the experimental work, so that's the centenary of that now. But it actually took Rutherford a couple of years to really understand what on earth this experiment was telling you because it was so counterintuitive to the prevailing picture of the material world and what atoms were made of. And so he published in 1911 a paper that the scattering of alpha and beta particles by matter and the structure of the atom. In other words, an explanation of what this very funny experiment was actually showing. And so this was then Rutherford's picture of what this experiment was showing. It was basically saying that the atom was more or less empty space and that at the centre of the atom there was a very um, dense nucleus um, he probably didn't use that terminology then, that's slightly later terminology, but very dense core at the centre of this atom that had a very, very strong electric field associated with it that would deflect these alpha particles which themselves had an electric charge. And so some of these particles would get scattered through at different angles, but some of them would actually get bounced straight back. Uh, they'd come in head-on towards this nucleus and get bounced straight back again. And so that was what this very funny experiment was showing, was showing that most of the atoms were empty space. And of course this was a very surprising result at the time. So that's a very important aspect of, of Rutherford's work, to really show us that there was this nucleus at the centre of the atom. And if you like, that's really the birth of nuclear physics, because uh, that's the first time we realised that there was substructure within the atom at the level of having a very tiny nucleus at the centre. The other thing which Rutherford was associated with very much uh, was transmutation. And I, Here's a picture of the alchemist. There's some displays to do with alchemy, to do with the Rutherford stuff downstairs. But of course, the alchemist always wanted to turn base metals into gold. Um, and a little bit like uh, some of the bankers have recently, these kind of get-rich-quick schemes uh, don't work really, do they? Um, it, it's very difficult to turn base metals into gold and you cannot turn one chemical element into another by chemical means because there's not enough energy in the system to change from one um, element to another. But one can do it by means of nuclear physics and this is what Rutherford was very much associated with. Again, another example of Rutherford being celebrated in New Zealand um, for, for an important piece of work in nuclear physics. So this was um, work now done during the period of the First World War. And of course at that time, many of Rutherford's most important assistants and students had to go away and fight, and some of them indeed didn't, did, unfortunately didn't come back. Um, and this really was a bit of a hiatus in the work that they were doing. And at the, at the beginning of the war, uh, Marsden was working with alpha particles again and trying to fire them at different materials and see what would actually happen. And he tried firing them at, at different things like oxygen and nitrogen and so on, uh, but didn't see very much. But during his absence uh, away um, in the army, Rutherford picked up on this work at Manchester and he, he fired these alpha particles at nitrogen and he saw a very penetrating particle come off and this particle had a, a, a unit of mass of one. So the alpha particle has four units of atomic mass. This particle uh, had one. And so what was actually taking place was a nuclear reaction induced by these alpha particles 
from natural radioactivity and the particle which was coming off this particle that had one unit of mass and an electric charge was actually the proton as we would now call it. So this is the discovery really of the proton as the basic unit inside the nucleus carrying one unit of electric charge. And this is work from about 1918. The other thing which had to wait an awful lot longer was finding out what other particles made up this nucleus at the centre of the atom. Rutherford actually predicted in 1921 that there might be particles it all, which also made up the nucleus that didn't carry an electric charge and that these neutrons would be quite easy to put into the nucleus because they didn't have a charge and so they wouldn't feel a repulsion that stopped you putting them in there. So actually 1921 he predicted that neutrons should exist but it took another 10 years or so until um, neutrons were actually discovered by Chadwick uh, at Manchester and again the basis of this was the alpha particle. Some alpha particles were fired at a foil of beryllium, a, a, a light metal, and a very penetrating particle came off after this nuclear reaction had taken place. But this particle was very, very penetrating. It would pass all the way through a sheet of paraffin and be measured in a cloud chamber much further away. And so this was the, the neutron, the counterpart of the proton that has almost the same mass but no electric charge. And so putting these two things together gives us our modern picture of the nucleus of the atom. The nucleus here, these, uh, for some reason I think conventionally red balls seem to be protons and blue balls and neutrons, I don't particularly know why. But there's the protons and neutrons in the nucleus and the electrons are travelling around outside of the nucleus. So that's our conventional picture of the atom. The other important piece of work done at a similar time, um, again by two students uh, heavily influenced by uh, Rutherford, uh, John Cockcroft, um, Yorkshireman Ernest Walton from County Waterford in Ireland, and they exploited the developments in industry and, and wider, which allowed the production of very, very high um, um, voltages, very high voltage electrical equipment so one could produce hundreds of thousands of volts. And so they took protons or hydrogen ions, accelerated them through uh, hundreds of thousands of volts and fired them at lithium and disintegrated that into two alpha particles. So this was the first artificial nuclear reaction, if you like, which could be initiated at will by man's intervention with a, with a particle accelerator. So this is the first particle accelerator and you can see the, the level of technology there is Walton sat in a tea chest at the bottom in a lead line tea chest I think looking at little flashes on the screen and these little flashes are these alpha particles produced um, wh when the reaction took place. I was reading a nice story that they, they wanted to show Rutherford this but Rutherford was quite physically large and whatever by this stage and also getting a bit clumsy and they had a, a great performance to actually get him into this chest to actually see something but he, he, he verified this as well. So this is a very very significant milestone in the, in, the, in the early history of nuclear physics using a particle accelerator to split up uh, the atom into different parts and so then that is our, our, our picture again of the nucleus of the atom uh, of which Rutherford contributed very greatly the idea of these protons and neutrons and of course we know now later that to some extent these protons and neutrons have a substructure in terms of quarks which we can see if we explore the nucleus at very very high energies. So just to sort of give you a sense of scale of the nucleus and just to remind you how really tiny it is I thought it was worth uh, sort of reminding ourselves so we start with a human scale couple of meters we come down to the scale of, of uh, uh, skin cells or something like that on the body and these cells are about 10 microns about 10 millionths of a meter in size we come down to the famous DNA molecule and that's about two billionths of a meter in size we come down again perhaps a uh, um, hundred times down to the size of the atom 
and then this nucleus at the centre of the atom is about a thousand million millionth of a metre. So it's really, really tiny. There are uh, 15 orders of magnitude between a, a human and um, the nucleus. So in the sort of last 10 minutes or so, I just wanted to talk a bit, little bit about Rutherford's legacy and also a little bit about what we do in nuclear physics today and how that can relate back to uh, the early work of, of Rutherford. Well, I've talked about Rutherford's important scientific achievements, but I think we shouldn't overlap the fact that this remarkable man was also an amazing teacher and mentor to a great many other brilliant scientists uh, in this country and in the wider world. And so these are just some of the people who worked very, very closely with Rutherford. Soddy, uh, Chadwick, Cockroft and Walton we've talked about already. Niels Bohr who came to Manchester to work with uh, Rutherford and really put the mathematics and the, and the theory on uh, Rutherford's uh, discovery of the nucleus. All these people who worked very closely with Rutherford were, all, were also very noted and received Nobel Prizes. And this is by no means an exhaustive list of people who worked very, very closely with Rutherford. So he had an amazing influence on the subject even for many years uh, following uh, his death. And he, and he died quite young, I think, in his, in his 60s. Um, it's, it's worth saying that there's still an enormous amount to learn in terms of nuclear physics. Um, we've still only uh, scratched the surface in, in many ways. And what this shows is all the possible isotopes which could exist. So an isotope is a combination of protons and neutrons um, to make a nucleus of an atom. And so protons this way, neutrons this way, and all of these black squares are isotopes that exist in, in uh, nature. They, they, they're stable isotopes that we would find in our Earth. And these are all the black squares. Well, all the yellow region around it are isotopes that nuclear physicists have studied in the laboratory and have learned something about their structure and their properties. But the green region actually shows all the possible isotopes that could exist in theory that one could produce. And you can see that more than half the stuff has not even been uh, ever studied in the laboratory. Um, of course, it might at some level become stamp collecting, to use Rutherford's famous term. But I can assure you there's a lot of interesting physics, especially to look at nuclei that have a lot of neutrons to protons as a ratio. The other thing which uh, Rutherford uh, sort of uh, pioneered in terms of uh, the beginnings, but we, we now know much more about, is nuclear astrophysics. And that's how the nucleus of the atom has an influence on how stars uh, burn and how um, elements are synthesized in stars and energy is produced in stars, particularly through the process of nuclear fusion. That's very important in stars like our sun, and we hope to harness this uh, uh, on the Earth for producing power in the future. The other aspect, which is really a great outstanding question, and one of the 11 key questions in physics, or in science, I think, suggested in the US a few years ago, is supernovae and how supernovae work and how they are responsible for producing the heavy elements like lead and gold and all these heavy elements which we have. Again, nuclear physics has a very, very strong role to play in determining the nuclear reactions that take place in exploding stars and supernovae. So there's an awful lot still um, to learn. So what would Rutherford have made of what we do now, that's why I thought I would sort of finish this talk. Well, he would certainly have recognised some of the technology. So again, this particle accelerator that started in the 1930s with Cockroft and Walton, this rather primitive kit with the, with the man sat in the tea chest, we, the particle accelerator, of course, is a key tool in understanding the structure of, um, of our physical world. The technology has moved on so that many of these components are now superconducting and they run at the temperature of liquid helium and they're very, very expensive <laughs> and so on. So the scale has changed, but the, but the tools uh, to a certain extent are the same. Um, we're also now able to actually not only accelerate um, nuclei or ions of stable materials which we find in nature, but also very short-lived radioactive isotopes can be accelerated 
and we can do experiments with them. And this is something that's only come about in the last few years. And so very big investments are being made. A 1 billion euro facility called FAIR is being built in Darmstadt in Germany to do nuclear physics with these radioactive isotopes. So the investment is still very strong worldwide to do uh, nuclear physics. It's interesting what Rutherford would have made of a 1 billion euro investment. He was very famously frugal. Uh, with, his, uh, with his work and his scientific experiments. Um, they, they tended to make do and mend. Um, the only times that Rutherford would really make a fuss to try and get money was if he wanted radioactive materials. And then he would send all kinds of nice letters and promise money and stuff. Um, but if it was in terms of fixing lab equipment or buying something, he was, he was really notably uh, frugal. And he even had offers from many organizations offering whatever money he might want to build up very grand laboratories and he turned these offers down because it wasn't seen as the thing to do really to make a lot of money out of doing science at that time. So they wouldn't have understood the scale. Um, they probably, he probably also wouldn't have understood the fact that these things are now so large that they run 24 hours a day. <laughs> The machine runs all the time. The scientists must go there and do their work all the time. Rutherford was famous for locking his laboratories at 6 o'clock. He told his, his young scientists to go home and think. And, uh, you know, this became increasingly difficult because the experiments became more complex. They'd start in the morning, set them up. It would come to tea time. And then they'd be told, well, you have to pack up and go home now and start again. So... Rapidly, the science has become big science. So big science was starting at the time, uh, latter, latter periods of Rutherford's life. But I don't think he would have recognised this very, very big science which we have now that requires such huge amounts of money and can't really be run just in a, a, you know, a simple room in a laboratory or something that can be run on a nine-to-five basis in a, you know, in, a, in, in a simple way. So, of course... Going on from that, Rutherford would have been very used to the idea of collaboration and collaboration by letter with scientists all over the world. The fact that people were travelling around even at that time, of course, Rutherford had come from New Zealand to England uh, to uh, Canada, he'd come back to Manchester and then latterly he'd, he'd return to Cambridge. So people were used to travelling around. There were people coming from around the world to study um, but I think it, it wasn't quite as multinational or as large scale as things are now. So when I'm working, typically I would work in a group of maybe 30 scientists. And you can see some people here uh, with this sort of amazing detector system. Uh, if you look at particle physics, you might be talking of hundreds or thousands of collaborators on the scale. And so that brings with it many challenges. And so, you know, it's a good question of how these people like Rutherford would have operated in that kind of environment. It might have been very difficult for them uh, compared to the freedoms that they had when things were very open and, and, and ill-defined. And, of course, I think he would have been astonished by the, the, the idea of this LHC at CERN, these 26-kilometre round tunnels colliding particles deep under the ground, not that this has been uh, wildly successful since it started, as we know. <laughs> but, um, I mean, he would have accepted that as well, probably, because he would have known that experimental science involves things going wrong and things needing to be fixed. But the scale of this science, when you look back to what they were doing in the 1920s or 30s, is quite astonishing, I think, over really just a few generations, isn't it? And the, and the sheer scale of the scientific apparatus that they're using. This is just one of the detectors at the LHC at CERN. It's five stories high. So Rutherford's stuff, you know, by, by needs, had to fit within what room or space they had available. You know, they couldn't go off to such enormous scale. And um, so, so let, me, let me conclude then. So I hope I've given you some kind of introduction to um, the birth of nuclear physics and Rutherford's role in it. I think really Rutherford is, is, is one of my scientific heroes. I think he, he was a remarkable man um, in his tenacity, in the way that he designed brilliant experiments to really get to 
um, the lowest level of matter and understand what it was made of. And really, by co our conventional looking back, we, th these, these apparatus look remarkably primitive and, and very difficult to operate. And these people worked extremely hard and were extremely gifted to get this information out. And of course, the other aspect is that Rutherford really uh, set in train a whole field of physics, nuclear physics, and he also trained and influenced a whole generation of young men who worked with him, and that carries forward, you know, towards the present day. So, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>